Welcome back to Why the Flow System. This is going to be the second installment, and it's going to cover what CEOs, companies themselves, uh, CTOs, VPs, people that make the decisions of whether or not they want to hire the flow system to uh, conduct training, consulting, and so forth. And I've got Nigel Thurlow here on the channel, and he's going to be answering uh, some hard questions I have for him that I've putting myself in your shoes would ask if I were you. Uh, but if you haven't seen this channel before, make sure to stick around for the Agile games, uh, the flow activities, and so forth that I have here. And of course, I have the flow system guide and audio version if you want to listen to it really quickly. Just make sure that you use the YouTube controls, uh, increase it to times two uh, speed, and you'll be on your way. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's start flowing. Roll that intro, and we'll get started. I'm back with Nigel Thurlow here with the Flow System. And of course, I am something I'm very excited about and I want to share with the community. And that's why I'm doing this. So my question to you is why should companies or corporations pivot to the Flow System over other trainings, trainers, consultancies, what have you? Like, what, what, why you guys? Um, so, should they pivot to the Flow System or should they learn what's in the Flow System? Because, you know, companies go and say, you know, we're doing Scrum or we're doing Agile. They mean being Agile, but they say doing Agile, I hope. Uh, well, they say doing when I hope they mean be, uh, uh, being Agile. But what we're sort of helping companies to understand is why Scrum isn't working. And I'm going to give you a sort of a, you, you and your viewers and your subscribers and push the notification bell, folks. Um, I'm trying to help you, James. Appreciate and so the, the thing is, you've got more viewers than I have. Um, but um, so. Go visit Nigel. That, Go visit Nigel, people. He's, he's linked on my channel. Go check him out. Anyways. So one of the Achilles tendon or the Achilles heel, and that's a, a sort of a, a metaphor from mythology, the Achilles heel of Scrum is the product owner. That's why Scrum doesn't work at scale in large organizations. And I'm talking about one of the people who worked with one of the creators and helped in the early days of the development of Scrum at scale. And so one of the, the, the biggest areas we play, we use Scrum at scale was in a, a major organization. Uh, and I'm well, we're known for this online. It was 3M Healthcare. So it's not against any rules to tell you that because that's public knowledge, and I've been cited by them online. But we developed Scrum at Scale or some of the early prototypes of Scrum at Scale within that organization. The product owner forced a major organizational change. How easy do you think it is to walk into an organization and say, you need to change your entire org chart, your entire your org chart, your, your way, move people around to different parts of the building, change the desk space, change the cubicle uh, configuration, and you need to work in a completely different way now, aligned to value streams with a whole product portfolio organization, which is what the product owner is, owner is at scale, actually, it's just portfolio management in an agile way. How easy do you think that is to do? And that's a rhetorical question. It's damned hard and almost impossible. So you walk into an organization that's got all this hierarchy and all these departments and ways of working and all these inefficient, bad processes, and you slap this person in who's supposed to be the CEO of the product, who nobody can overrule, nobody can defy, they have the final say, they make all the decisions, and this was a person who the other day just went on their first two-day product owner course. See the problem, yeah? Yep. Just, just, just the thing. Yep. Uh, and even if they're really worldly wise and they've been doing a bunch of stuff for a while and got the piece of paper to validate that in some way, that's the Achilles heel of Scrum. And I'm talking to you know my friends at high levels in, in, in the Scrum world and saying this is the challenge you've got. It forces an organizational change. If you take the product owner away, what do you think you're left with? A team doing Scrum or a set of teams doing Scrum Ooh. without, team without using product direction? Well, they're using, they're using the framework to help them organize themselves into a standardized repeatable process, PDCA, by the way. But they, they do this standardized repeatable process, and they've got a board that they might call a scrum board, but it looks like a very three-column Kanban board, you know, as the Kanban practitioners would call it. And Kanban means billboard or signboard, so it's not a bad description for the visual control of the work. Mm -hmm. And then you've got some coach, which we call a scrum master. And that's what they're supposed to be a coach. And so what have you got now? Testing you here. 
Sorry. So we, I was just no like, product I'm we like, got we got no not the product, product owner. It all falls apart in my head. So I'm like, what do we have? I'm like, I'm not sure. No direction, a, no prioritization. Like you've got a cat. You've got what people like to call a Kanban team. Because well, what you've got, you've got an intake. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can prioritize this with service level agreements, operational level agreements, and other priorities from Hoshin plans or, or you know, portfolio priorities. That all this existing prior, pro, pro, product portfolio management and product management exists. It feeds an intake. There's got to be a priority in the company, even if they're really bad at prioritization, which most of them are. There still has to be do this before you do that. I mean, there's just just the reality, yeah. Yeah, but my head and, like you can't have Scrum without the product owner. Is is in my head. Well, so I'm like, what do we have? I'm like, I don't know. Is there a name for it? It's not Scrum. So that's what I was well, like thinking. Well, that because it's as Ken says, the rules of Scrum are immutable, which means they're mandatory. Yeah. You take one thing away from Scrum, it's no longer Scrum. It looks. You may call it Scrum. You may, and that's what a lot of people do, by the way. They don't yeah. do Scrum properly. Uh, um, so the reality of it is, is that most organizations, it's not the delivery side of the organization that's actually the biggest problem. So the people who actually do the work, the execution of the work and the team members and the teams that actually do the work is actually not the biggest problem. What the biggest problem is, is this m gigantic ball of bureaucracy organized into towers of power we call silos, yeah? yeah? And all the decades of hideousness there that can't make a decision. And then what we do is we walk in and go, we're gonna stick some product owners there who are junior roles, by the way, they're not vice presidents, even though the scrum purist would say the V that must be a vice president that's the product owner. Now, let me tell you, I work with a lot of executives. If I give them a pad of post-it notes and a sharpie and say, your job is now to write user stories, <laughs> I can, you can imagine what they'll say to me, yeah? yeah. Words that we won't broadcast, yeah? Yeah, so there's on this problem. channel, please, yeah. So, so what ends up happening is the Scrum Master, sorry, the product owner and the Scrum Master end up become synonymous with sort of team managers and, and sort of, you know, something like that. And that's not to decry Scrum. I believe in Scrum strongly. It's in here. Mm -hmm. Scrum the Toyota way fits in here, yeah? Because I still think it's one of the best uh, patterns for a team to do standardized repeatable work. And I've described this, I know once to you, and you've sort of pulled a face at me when I said it's PDCA with time boxes and the Kanban board, but it is. Yeah. Uh, and, and all right, you've got a couple of defined roles, which are even less, more, uh, uh, more loosely defined now with the latest Scrum Guide, yeah? yeah. It's got a team, team of people, do, do stuff. <laughs> um, but we don't tell you how to be a team, but it's a team of people that does stuff, awesome. Yeah. And there's a product goal now, which is a distal goal. And you've got your proximal goal, which is your sprint goal, which if you read some of this stuff, you'll understand what I'm talking about there. Uh, and that's all in here as well, by the way. Proximal and distal goals are all in there. And that's all to do with organizational goals, product level goals, team level goals. Um, so this is where the Achilles heel comes in. So rather than go and fight companies and organizations and say, thou shall do these rules that are immutable in Scrum and thou shall obey, which is what Craig does, Craig Larman from Less, and I know Craig reasonably well, we bump into each other periodically, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant computer scientist, different type of person, brilliant, brilliant computer scientist, and people who know him all know what I mean by that, and I have great Trust me, I have a great deal of respect for Craig and to Baz as well, who's uh, Baz Voder is his business partner in Less. Less is brilliant. Truly, Less is one of the best ever implementations of Scrum. Everybody should take the course and study it because it's three, three days of learning with Craig and all but the last two hours is all about Toyota. And the last two hours is about Scrum. And I'm telling you, because I've been through his courses, I've been on his courses and he's a brilliant, he, he, I've had dinner with him. He makes me laugh immensely. He and I, presented at different events and bumped into each other the problem with less you obey the rules or he walks away so how many companies do you think are going to walk you're going to walk in and go you will obey me you know i am in control you will do exactly what i say the way i say it or it won't work and i leave well if you do exactly what i say of course it'll work that's the whole point yeah so um but you can't do that in companies so I've given up trying to fight companies and I've given up trying to uh, tell them what they're doing wrong. I'm sure my but viewers wanted, will be very happy to hear that. Yeah, because <laughs> it's painful. And I, I wrote the other day that I'm no longer going to be a, you know, consultants 
tend to turn out to what I wrote the day as being insultants. And it's my friend in Puerto Rico actually gave me that little anecdote. Because what happens, we go in, we get called in as a consultant. You know, that, and if people are watching this, we're dealing with companies, especially trainers and coaches and people who run their small coaching businesses, excuse me, trying to get business with organizations. They go in there and everybody, they, they do some swish presentation. The glosses come out. Well, I don't even do glossy brochures anymore. I send them a few bullet points on an email and said, if this is of interest, let's have a conversation before I get into MSAs and, and negotiations. It's pointless writing a 45 page deck of PowerPoint misery and telling them why you're so great. I, I say, this is what you said you wanted. These are the options I can offer you. And that's like a lean proposal. Mm -hmm. And it's literally four or five bullet points. This, you know, these are the ideas and these are the prices. If these are in the ballpark, let's go into a deeper conversation. But you walk into an organization, you do all your glossy song and dance and you, and you sort of, you know, what they call the dog and pony show. And then the company starts pasting platitudes all over the wall, cliche statements, you know, mm -hmm. our mission is to serve. Teamwork what makes the mean? dream work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, what the hell does that all mean? You know? So, and you can't translate that into actions and doing it's just statements, you know, save the world, you know, feed the hungry and all this sort of thing. And so then we, we, after they've done all that stuff and it's on the wall, so it becomes wallpaper and people outside of the U S are more familiar with wallpaper than people in the U S who just paint walls. My house is painted like every other American home. And then it, so when things are on the wall, they merge into the wallpaper and they become invisible. Nobody sees them anymore. Yeah. Cause they're just so familiar. They don't even look at them anymore. So we've got all our great statements of how we're going to change the world and all our platitudes and this organizational transformation. And if you watch some of my keynotes, you'll know that word is the totally incorrect word to use. It has no relevance in organizational change initiatives or in digital transformation, another load of nonsense. Digital transformation is modernization just for the, the viewers. It's not transformation, which means to turn something from one thing into something completely different. So if you're a bank and you want to become a gas station or a petrol station in England, that's transformation. But if you're a bank that wants to evolve, that's modernization, evolution. And if you're moving from doing traditional management techniques to new management techniques, that's transition. So just, just a few uh, words from the dictionary and go look them up if you don't believe me. So anyway, platitudes. Then we all dance around and we, we, we high five and we fist bump and all the rest of it. We get all excited. We do a bunch of training, which lasts about six to nine months, train a bunch of people. And we make millions of dollars from the training or hundreds of thousands of dollars, whatever it is. And that's often referred to as the swoop and boop. Uh, approach. And I thank my friend, Ellen Gottersteiner, a brilliant product owner, deep expert in product management, product ownership. Uh, so do look her up, Ellen Gottersteiner. But you swoop in, you do a bit of thing, you fly away and you go, good luck. Have so that's the, that's the yeah. training model. Yeah. And that's what it makes a lot of money. But then what happens is then the companies are floundering. So you, you're going like me as a consultant. You go and listen to them, platitude, 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 pat on the back. Then you go train all the troops. Then we get the scrum masters, the agile coaches, the other people coaching those, those troops, the people on the front line, the people who execute and do the value generation. Because trust me, up there, there's little value generation. It's all happening down here, by the way. Mm -hmm. And so we're doing all the value generation. And then after a few weeks or a few months of doing this, we've got our Kanban boards. We're using some of our value stream mapping, some other visualization techniques, now Wardley mapping and other things in there. And we start to make visible all the ugly stuff. We're turning over the rocks and all the constraints and the bottlenecks in the system are becoming visible. All the inefficiencies and the dysfunctions in the organization are now becoming visible. And as Ken Schwaber, I'm paraphrasing something he once said, but, you know, Scrum is like your mother-in-law. If you invite her to stay, even though she loves you very much, she'll point out all your faults. And that's what Scrum does. But Scrum does it with a great big hammer because it goes in and forces organizational change. The organization can't function and everybody says Scrum doesn't work here. No, 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 no. Your organization doesn't work. It's not Scrum. Mm -hmm. Scrum works fine if you do it, but it's too hard. It's too brutal. Mm -hmm. It's too hammer cracking a walnut. It's too aggressive. Same as less. It's just hideously aggressive. Now, some less practitioners, you know, Gene in New York, who I know very well, is a fantastic less trainer and advocate. He'd argue with me some of that, but he and I have had some good discussions and he really gets these things. So then what happens is, 
I tell I consultant, you know, the, the royal consultant, we tell the organization, here's all your problems. This all sucks. You need to fix all these things. Yeah. So what am I now doing? I'm now insulting the company. So they called me in to consult with me. Mm-hmm. But then they, but they get offended because if I say the workers suck, let's do all this fixing the workers. They go, oh, yeah, Nigel, go fix the workers. They yeah, all yeah, suck. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Uh, but when I say, hey, executive or boss, big manager or big VP, you suck. They don't like that because I'm saying, well, you need to change. And they really don't like that very much because it's actually not the work that's complex. It's actually not these poor souls who are actually working every day really hard to deliver value to customers. It's actually the organizational design that is the problem. Mm -hmm. And so when you go into companies, what we want to do now is provide a level of education and understanding and a level of tooling to help them visualize and what we call learn to see. And so it's work as done versus work as imagined because they've all got this notion of how work gets done. Mm -hmm. We write out a post-it note, magically something pops out the other end. (laughs) And all those problems in the middle, well, you know, just go figure them out. You know, don't bring me, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. And people who say that should be fired. They're just not good managers or leaders um, because their job, as a more experienced executive leader manager is to solve problems for those who are less experienced. Managers should be problem solvers. And there's one of the concepts in the flow system, we didn't invent it, which is known as boundary spanning or the boundary spanner, the the person or people who interface between multiple teams and the boundaries or the, you know, the outer edges of these various different teams and systems. And they become functional leadership helping the organization solve these bottlenecks, constraints, and dysfunctions. Because most teams, you go down and fiddle around a little bit, teach them a bit of standardized, repeatable process, PDCA, you know, continuous improvement, Scrum, and teach them how to use a few visualization techniques like Kanban, value stream mapping, and that type of thing. And then you give a bit of what, what the industry calls OPEX, operational excellence. You teach them some skills to make them be able to be really super duper efficient at delivering value and, and good outcomes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a difference between efficiency and effectiveness. So you go and do all that. Okay. Then what happens is all the rest of their problems are dependencies. And those dependencies are on the organizational design. So legal, financial, procurement, vendor management, compliance. Not just decision. the VP, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Just, just saying, not for just anyone's the, watching, yeah. it's not just... It's not just it for, for that. It's, there's other stuff. No, too. no, exactly. So they get all these problems that are now external to the team or the product delivery organization. Mm. And the organizational structure has been badly designed because everything's organized vertically. Yeah. Towers of power. Yeah. VP, VP, VP. Lots of worker bees who apparently report to the VP. And let me tell you, you don't report to the VP. Only two or three people report to the VP. There's this whole hierarchy of reporting to somebody. And none of this is creating any value, by the way. It's just, you know, creating meetings and process and documentation and lots of reply all emails and things. And so what happens is we need to cut across this organizational units. And so when you start using Scrum or Kanban techniques or any of these, you make all this visible. But none of these can fix this. Mm -hmm. So what we're bringing here is an explanation and understanding of that problem and this interconnected, intertwined nature of the triple helix. So organizations start to see that they need to fix it. So my job is no longer to tell the organization what's wrong. My job is to teach the organization the skills necessary so they can see what's wrong. They can then choose whether to pull that and take appropriate action to solve it. If they choose not to, it's not the fault of some tool, method, technique, or approach. And this is not a framework, remember. It's just a system of learning and understanding. And so it's down to the organization to decide to take the action. I can tell you from two, three decades of experience, very few of them will. And, And this is where, you know, not to the not because of the people trying to do it, not to the scrum and agile coaches and the lean coaches and the Kanban practitioners and all these types of folks. They're trying, but we're trying to hit the, we're trying to punch the organization rather than show the organization how to learn to, to it's the whole teach a man to fish 
sort of analogy. Mm -hmm. We're going in there fishing for them. What we need to do is to stop doing that, teach them how to fish, and then guide them with a little bit of gentle coaching and mentoring to be able to know where to fish and how to solve the problem. So again, I'm going to go back to reflective listening here as I do on my other videos, hopefully. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, just a clarifying question of like, and this is what I'm hearing is that, you know, you made some pretty strong remarks about VPs and, you know, the organizations really at the upper levels really desiring to change. And so what I'm hearing is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're planning on coming into organizations, not only helping and giving tools like Scrum and Kanban to the lower levels that actually will help uh, the flow of value through the system, but also helping after you help to do that, but allow, helping bring light to those problems that the organization needs to change and really educating them on tools and resources that will be able to uh, foster those changes and help emphasize why they need to do those. No, absolutely. And so, you know, we talked a bit before when we last spoke about companies getting engaged and, and whether companies are, are warming to what we're, we're teaching here. And so I've spoken to a number of different groups. I can't name them all for confidentiality reasons, but I'm working with international banks in two different continents. I'm working with uh, large companies in, 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 let's just say, in different industries that are pulling on this. I'm working with consulting companies. We've got academic endorsement from a European university who are teaching the next generation of leaders who are going through MBA programs. This is now three semesters worth of study. Organizations are understanding that learning Scrum and Agile techniques aren't enough. The learning and a lot, and some of the Agile practitioners are now warming to this and starting to talk about this. We're talking about business agility having organizational agility, the ability to respond rapidly to markets, changing conditions, things like COVID, you know, respond quickly. And it's like, you know, the analogy is like the ship that's stuck in the Suez Canal as we're recording this. How quickly can you turn the ship, yeah? If it takes you three weeks to free it and two weeks to turn it around, that's not very, not very agile, yeah? No. So if, you're, if your competitors come out with some disruptive innovation, is it going to take you three years to catch them? Tesla, the, the model, you know, the model, model three, disruptive innovator there if you understand a little bit about clay christensen's work so they're they're now completely decimating and disrupting the automotive industry everybody's taking years to catch up including my ex-employers at toyota and now we've got volkswagen who've got the despite all their diesel gate challenges they've still got a ton of money new ceo because i think he's in jail now um, and if i'm wrong on that it's just my opinion um, but the thing is this you've got uh, up and coming you've got companies like vw who are gone toe to toe with Toyota over the years about uh -huh. being the, the, the biggest selling automotive manufacturer who are now catching up to Tesla. And so, but it's taken how many years to get anywhere near catching up to them and bring out equivalent or potentially better products. Too long. And so, and Tesla's an aspirational sort of, you know, product and that's why people are excited. So a business agility and organizational agility is how fast can we pivot and do the, and do catch these disruptive innovators yeah. when you're talking about product agility you know if i pull out my iphone and we know that the iphones tend to be technically behind the android products but this is better more stable high quality and lots of reasons i probably have lots of arguments with android uh, fans about but the reality is the Samsungs of this world and the and the Huawei Hui, Hui, or whatever you pronounce the the chinese brand which begins with the h um they can never pronounce it anyway uh they come out and innovate really fast new ideas and it takes apple time to catch up because they want it to be qualitative not just quantitative but that's what product <laughs> agility is all about how fast can you pivot your product and move more quickly so a lot of the things that and, and you need to do to enable that in your organization you're not going to find in an agile or a scrum class i'm sorry to say because they're just teaching a define particular way of doing things what we're doing is providing the tools and the knowledge behind the tools and the techniques and the deeper understanding as an educational level of the things organizations need to understand to be able to solve these problems holistically and actually deliver more effectively to their customers because as drucker said you know without a customer there's no the rest of it doesn't exist you know there's only one there's only one purpose of a company and that's to create a customer which is and who we're talking people, to hopefully right so yeah exactly because <laughs> the thing is this if you forget about this thing 
there's actually no reason for the rest to exist. And some people say, oh, employees first. Well, I'm sorry, but without a customer, there are no employees. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, anyway, go ahead. I was going to say, just as Scrum, you know, obviously is, you know, caught fire and, you know, over the last 20 years or so been become more and more prevalent because of how quickly people are able to pivot and the idea of business agility and product agility and so forth. Uh, the flow system, I and mean, can you imagine, like, yes, just because we've sent people to a two-day class and they've studied Scrum and they've become Scrum masters, how much that's, that idea of Scrum and how much that was able to do. I mean, just imagine, I mean, I'll, I'll guess I'll throw it up on the screen and post, but the flow system has levels and levels and levels of deep knowledge. How much more if we helped our employees, as I speak as, you know, as a company here to, to really help people know the the depth and breadth of, of these of this knowledge and education how much more and the faster could you pivot how much you know how much better products would you create you know all these kinds of things come to mind and so if anyone is interested i do have links uh, to these trainings if you want to take a closer look and a discount code of course which nigel has uh, allowed me to to give you all for 10 percent off if you are interested but uh on to one of my uh I guess, harder questions here. Um, you've already talked a little bit about how you've been received about companies, uh, but if there's one thing you wanted to communicate to a decision maker sitting here across from them, if they're watching this, hopefully, uh, and if you are, make sure to like and subscribe and you know stick around for other uh, great games that will help your organizations. But uh, what would you communicate to them, Nigel? What would be like the thing that they, you know, the hammer to, to break through that wall of that company is going to choose the flow system over all the other things, what would it be? That's an interesting question. And, you know, my answers that don't, aren't, don't tend to be short and sweet. Um, and, and I could use some silly things like if you tried the rest, then, you know, if you tried the rest and try the best, but it's none of that nonsense <laughs> at all. But if you're truly, truly serious about changing the way your organization functions and operates, you need to go beyond the simple techniques that are presented in the typical two-day classes from the normal sort of organizational folks such as Scrum, Agile, Kanban, all valuable techniques, and your team should learn them. I'm not decrying any of them, I still teach them. Your team should learn them. But if you truly want to organize, uh, truly want to understand how to affect organizational change, you need to go a lot deeper and a lot broader. And you're not going to get that, unfortunately, from siloed or, or fixed closed system type thinking. You need to think much broader than that. And the flow system provides you with the understanding and comprehension of how these different helixes intertwine with each other. And I guess this is the final word on that. When I created this diagram, and I, I was going to tell you this the last time we spoke, but when I created this, I think the only clever thing I did was draw three intertwined lines, this triple helix. And it was one of the guys who was working for me. And Dan, if you're out there and you listen to this, you'll know who you are. And he walked past my desk one day when I was drawing this and he says, I like your DNA structure. And that was where it came from. The DNA of organizations, the triple helix flow. Because if an organization is trying to do anything, any of these bits independently, you won't solve your problems. Organizations are complex and complex entities, the complex adaptive systems. You can't just go throw an agile technique or scrum or something similar at it and expect magical things to happen. And the thing with say, if it goes and imposes a bunch of stuff, they've copied off everybody else and rebranded, renamed, but they don't do anything about the, how the organization functions or works. And they don't tackle the things that actually need to be tackled. So if you really want to transform your organization in using those words that people like to use, you really want effective organizational change and you want to be able to respond rapidly to the disruptive innovators and become the disruptive innovators, you need to think beyond the agile echo chamber and look a bit deeper into some of these tools and techniques. And I mentioned earlier, we have a number of companies engaging with us already. And we're all right. And only on Wednesday of this week, as we're recording this, and this is third week in March, on Wednesday of this week, I actually delivered a four hour workshop to 140 senior leaders and managers and executives in a major international bank, teaching them this material as a precursor 
to a long-term leadership academy program they're going through where I'll be involved at various different levels, helping them learn some of these things to affect real change in an organization. That's the message to, to companies out there. Still learn the lean and agile and scrum stuff, very important. And in fact, the lean is the root of a lot of this other stuff anyway. So go learn that sort of TPS lean thinking. But you've got to go a lot broader and a lot deeper into some of these constructs and concepts if you truly want to affect organizational change, the type of change that a lot of people are talking about. They talk about transformation. It's a longer answer than a couple of sentences, but I think, you know, you know me. Yeah, I understand. You've talked about, you know, why, you know, companies should choose you. You've talked about, I just asked you what the one thing is you wanted to communicate. You just described a little bit, which reminded me, I wanted to go off script just for a second and ask this one final question. You talked about how you're helping one organization and your plan there. Are you able to go into, or should people contact you for more details on how to do, how you're going to do consulting differently and how you're going to set up these things or is that public? No, I mean, I'll be publishing more and more information, but yes, they can reach out and contact us, of course. The whole idea behind a consortium, and this is really important, we don't really talk about this as much as we talk about the system and the training and the learning and everything else, but the consortium is a collection of some of the top industry experts out there. People have been in the lean industry for the last three, nearly four decades, teaching it at a a deep, uh, exceptional level of knowledge. People from the complexity thinking industry, people from the team performance industry. We've got academics, we've got universities involved. So we're not coming in with the usual flashy flashy presentation and $400, $500 an hour PowerPoint presentations. And yes, I used to be in that world where we paid people to do PowerPoint presentations at that level of money. We're actually talking about coming in and helping you as an organization understand what you need to do so you can take the action. You see the accent on you, meaning them. This is not me coming in and telling you all suck and you need to do all these things and follow me. This is me coming in and giving you the understanding and the tools and the visualization capabilities for you to understand what you where your problems are and how you need to change and when you are when you're struggling to understand what type of problems there are whether they're in the ordered linear predictable world or the unordered unpredictable non-linear world so this is what we call the sort of complex world in this unordered world or the sort of more linear world which is where tps and lean thinking fits then we can help you understand that and I hope you understand which tools to use in those worlds. And you did ask me a little bit ago, one of the other things I'll, I'll mention as it comes to my mind is one of the key things for organizations is what we call weak signal detection. Mm-hmm. So how do you know what you need to know before you need to know it? So that's mm-hmm. in the complexity thinking world, which is over here. Yeah. And then we've got tools which are known as sense making. And then there are actual products you can get called sense maker, which help you make sense. And this is early detection, early warning. How do you know before the problem is going to hit you? How do you know before the disruption is coming? How do you know when to make that decision to pivot or to stop doing this and prioritize that? That's weak signal detection. When you've got an organization that takes six months to get you a new laptop or six to nine months to sign an MSA, there there is no weak signal detection there. You want to know COVID's coming before COVID's everywhere. You want to know three months before it arrives that COVID's coming. So by the time it arrives, you're you're not impacted significantly. So when the markets are going to change, or there's going to be a recession, or there's going to be a, a, a major innovation in a product, how do you know? And so that's weak signal detection, sense making. It's all over here in the complexity world. These are things that will give you key differentiators from your competition and help you to go beyond your current competition. And these are the things that companies and organizations need to be learning. Let me tell you, there's only complexity practitioners talking about this at the moment. The the, the Scrum and the Agile world are, uh, in the main, clueless about this. And this is the type of thing they need to start understanding how all these things intertwine and intermesh. This is in itself a complex adaptive system. There is no linear causality. There's no 5Y analysis in here. And in fact, 5Y analysis won't work in a complex world. It's a reductionist technique. It's deductive. It's a deductive reasoning. It won't work in a complex situation because the causes are changing constantly in a complex adaptive system. Mm -hmm. So these are the sort of things that organizations really, truly need to learn. I went off script a bit there, but so did you. (laughs) I, I totally agree. But the 
is are you allowed to go into any of the details of how your consulting will be different or formatted differently you mentioned the consortium the fact that you know you have a group of i don't know how many and you can elaborate i guess but of these deep experts but how will you partner with the organizations differently than these other organizations have and what does that look like and what's what's the value prop different there so or are you my, allowed to go I mean, into it? Do they need to contact you? I mean, I'm not. Well, no, you on the spot. no, I'm not going to go into. I'll go into a little bit of context, but I'm not going to go into detail about individual engagements because okay. they're all privileged, uh, privileged under non-disclosure. I mean, if anyone's watching wants to engage with you, will there? I mean, I'm not sure that your, their engagements with others will reflect will, will reflect what you do with them, but because I know you do. No, everything people can contact. contact me directly. There's lots of ways to get hold of me. I get pinged on Twitter, on LinkedIn. I've, I've had, you know, executives t tweet me before and ask me to contact them. Uh, and then there's all the traditional things. You can actually give me a call, you know, 844 Dr. Scrum, 844 I do flow. They'll all get to my phone, you know. And, uh, you know, I just had a bit of fun with toll free one time. Um, and because you can get me through the website, you can join the Slack community, all the links that, that James will make available to engage. My approach is a little bit different now. I've done this consulting thing for the best part of most of my career. Um, even in Toyota, I was, you know, technically an internal consultant because even as an employee of the company, I'm being called in to help departments, divisions, groups, and I'm training, teaching, coaching. So I'm consulting internally effectively. Um, but what I want companies to do is, first of all, I engage at the very senior level because if change is really going to happen, it has to start changing at the top. And there's, a, there's an old adage I sometimes use in my presentations, never sweep the stairs from the, from the bottom or the steps because you just create more mess. Mm. So we need to start here and sweep down. That's what you do when you vacuum your carpets at home or vacuum your floors. If you have a stairwell or a staircase, you start from the top. And if you don't, then do that unless you work better. Um, and so the thing is, we start at the top, I engage here. And I really need to understand, do they, and, and Craig does this a little bit. This is Craig Larman's approach. Start here and decide, are these people really interested in change or is this just, you know, the next flavor? We've got a new VP comes in. They're going to go do some stuff for a couple of years, earn some stripes and go on to the next role where either it will go horizontally in the company or leave to a different organization, which is a, a cycle. That's another problem that causes challenges with getting transformational change to stick. Whereas when you look at organizations like Toyota, it's behavioral. So it's, it is the culture of the company. It's become the culture because of the behaviors. So if we get that level of engagement, my next, my next approach is to show them and to educate them in some of the things we've been talking about, but at a level that they want to consume it at. There's different levels of consumption of education and knowledge, depending on the level of the organization you're talking to. Once we've got that, then it's our job. And this is, you know, for the lean folks out there, this is plain old lean thinking. We make the current condition visible so they can see what's happening. And then we help them understand how they, they might solve these challenges. And then we have access to a group of very, very influential people from very different walks of life, deep experts across this gamut. And I won't name them at this point, but, you know, there's a lot of them in that organization. Some of them will be revealing very soon when we've got final agreements in place where we can make things public. Uh, and that means we can call upon a very powerful network of deep experts, not your typical consulting organizations with the bot factories that they, they, they you know, no, no disrespect to them, but maybe it is disrisrespectful. They, they put them through their bot farms. And they all turn up and they get 14 or 20 people sat around a large boardroom table. They're all tapping away doing PowerPoints or their expenses or something else non-value added while they're, they're charging out to the organization. We're trying to get away from that model. We're trying to get away to the model where we want to teach you what you need to know, support you and coach you in those disciplines, and then allow you and enable you, well, not allow you, but enable you to be able to take the right decisions and pull the challenges and solve them. And we'll be there to support you along that journey. And I want to consult with you and support you, not insult you and tell you you're all doing the thing wrong. Mm. And, and I'm going to give you one thing. I was having a con this, and I'll finish my comment on this because it's about organizations. We talk about complex work and work that's sort of in the order domain. So if, you, if anybody's familiar with complexity thinking, there's sort of five key domains of complexity thinking. If you look at something called the Kenevin framework, 
And essentially, you've got this sort of aporetic or aporia in the middle, which for simple folk like me, it means confused or confusion. There's a deeper meaning, but it is basically a confused state. Then you've got chaos and complexity, and you've got clear and complicated. Clear is sort of like things are simple and obvious, very clear. It's where people use that hideous phrase, best practices. I don't mind if you use current best practices, but not best practices, because best means this, you can't get any better. And there's always better. There's always improvement. There's always ties. Mm -hmm. So current best practices, simple standard procedures. An individual person can follow the procedures without little prompting. In the complicated world, you've got things where things are well understood, linear causality, poke you in the eye, it hurts. We get all, all understand that. Uh, but you need experts to work together to actually do the work. That's OK. So this is the ordered linear world, which the lean world understands very well. Mm -hmm. And you get over into this sort of complex world where things are either chaotic. So, you know, COVID was chaos to begin with, confused and apparatic. And then we dived into chaos while we try to figure out what to do. And this is where command and control is actually needed. Command and control works there because you need somebody to say, grab the hoses, put the fire out, do this, do that, do the other. Not all. There's no time for a meeting and a PowerPoint deck in, in chaos, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, when you get into complexities where things are, are very intertwined and entangled, but there's no clear outcome and there's no clear predictability. Now, I was talking to an organization and, and to a lady from an organization who said she's having a hard problem mapping complexity into real-world projects and things in the organization. Mm -hmm. So I sort of wrote a note and I said, look, is it really complex work? Because I did an exercise the other day where I said to people, is your work over here in the complexity world, unpredictable, unordered, chaos and whatever? You, mm. Or is it over here, predictable, ordered, blah, 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 you know, experts, everything, everything is it well understood. It's difficult, but difficult doesn't mean complex. It means difficult, yeah? yeah? It's not complex. So complex means there's no, you don't really know if what you do is going to work. That's complex. And there's other, many other ways to describe it. So I said, in the organization, or in an organization, typical organizational design, we've got all those silos we talked about, some behavioral issues, which is in the team science section, which is, you know, lack of communication, lack of collaboration, no shared mental models, no shared cognitions, no psychological safety, no active listening. These things don't tend to exist. And it's this that makes predictable work complex. It makes move stuff from the predictable side to the unpredictable side. The actual work is often not complex. The execution becomes complex not the work itself. And this is exacerbated by a lack of skills and a lack of trust in the people. So a lack of skills or trust makes the work or the environment complex. So a, a lot of it falls down to that in organizations. So the work's often misclassified as the way the work is done is not clear or well understood, or the poor organization design makes the execution complex so they go classify everything as complex. Yeah. Yeah. That makes total sense because you have like, every, if you don't understand a problem, but everything is complex to you. Right. So it's perceptual. Yeah. yeah it's it's a perception. perceptual. So. But actually the work isn't really complex. You just don't understand it. Yeah. And that's, and so we're trying to solve that problem. And Scrum and Agile don't solve that problem, by the way. They give you some techniques to plan. Scrum's a planning system. It's a planning cadence. And Ken's quoted that to me. It's a planning cadence. And so the thing is, this it helps you to order the work you do, but you've got to understand the work. OK, mm -hmm. and there's, there's some unknowns, but just because something emerges doesn't make it complex work. And actually, a lot of scrum isn't empirical. Feedback isn't empiricism. Go study. I wrote an article on LinkedIn. Go read it. Go study what inductive reasoning is. And feedback doesn't make it empirical. So be very careful when you're describing empiricism and, scrum and you're doing empirical work, because most of the time you're not. Most of the time you're doing predictable, ordered, pre-planned, known outcome work. There's some difficulty, so you need some experts. It's complicated, but it's not complex, and it's neither is it empirical. It's just iterative. It's very little. It's very rarely emergent work that you're doing. It's empirical is when you have no idea what the outcome is going to be. That's where you place empiricism and inductive reasoning and experimentation. Now, here's the thing. If you solve the organizational design, skills and trust, then the work predominantly will become ordered and predictable. And the flow system helps you learn the why and how of all of this. Then you need to apply it and reflect the results. 
Learning without coaching, I said this to you before, or training without coaching is waste. You must apply it, seek coaching and support and reflect on the outcomes. You must learn to apply both deductive, inductive and abductive reasoning. And as I said to you before, which Agile class has taught you this? Right. And I, put, I wrote a note to myself and I was thinking about it, none of them, with one exception that I'm aware of. Scrum the Toyota way. This is where this all started originating. I started mm -hmm. teaching that. And the flow system is what's emerged from my learning from that and a bunch of other sources. Well, we uh, the focus of the question was to talk about how you're going to be different than, uh, you know, partner with them. I was expecting, you know, well, we do three weeks, three weeks here and three weeks there with this or that, or this is what we There's do. There's no one size fits all, James. Exactly. No I know. But I, I, I'm so used to it. I'm here. I'm used to expecting that answer. So I just want to address the, the, I, the elephant in the room to, for the audience. What did I say to you there is, is to inform and educate. It's yes. not a template. Exactly. If you want a template, go buy safe. Go pay Dean a few million and, and buy safe. That's fine. Okay. If you want a template, then come talk to me about the challenges in getting it to work and I'll help you solve the gaps. So, I mean, that's the other thing. We can, go, we can help solve the gaps in current implementations of other tools, techniques, frameworks, methods, approaches. And if you're happy with your safe organization, but you have some challenges you're trying to solve that SAFE isn't solving for you or less or Scrum at scale or any, you know, or any of the others. Uh, but SAFE is known as that sort of monolithic, gigantic, big yes. thing. They call it the big picture because there's a lots of stuff on it. And there's reason there's no detail, isn't it? It's a space to put the detail. But anyway, enough of knocking <laughs> SAFE. Um, so you go and put in SAFE in your organization. It's working for you. Yeah. But you've got some challenges in some areas. Come talk to me and I'll help you solve those and fill in the gaps. So remember a system of learning and understanding, not a one size fits all template. Everything is contextual. Everything has to be applied within context, bounded applicability. We talked about earlier, this contextual limitation of tools. And really everybody has to find there. I'm quoting my friend, Ritzo Shingo, Shingo-san, when he says, you have to find your own way. In fact, there's a quote in, there's a quote in the book from, from Shingo, if I read it, you know, he says, I strongly recommend that you create your own way. The flow system builds on TPS in helping you do that. Yeah. Ex-president of Toyota China, 40 years in Toyota. That's the way we work with organizations. I don't have a template. If you want a template, go see one of the big five consultancies. Uh, if you want a one size fits all, go buy one of the big frameworks. If you want to do it a little bit differently, come talk to me. Yep. And I think that that's, you know, so you're not going to get obviously uh, from Nigel, a, uh, a templated answer here, but if do contact him, if you want to, his link, his links, all of them, all the links will be in the description below. And uh, which you're gonna have to send me a few of those, by the way, cause I'm not sure I have them all, but um, you know, contact him for, you know, as he understands your organization, he'll come up with a, a very clear way as, as I've heard, been able to hear how a few other things are going that he, his, he really does apply stuff to the context of your organization. And it's not just a short or a quick fix. It is something that I believe that he and the flow system will be walking with you and uh, really dive, becoming a part of your organization to help it essentially. And so I think that it's going to be huge. It's going to be different. I can't go into all the details of all, the, of all that I know either, but I think that you should contact him. You should contact him is what I'm trying to say. But if you decide to take the training, don't forget my links in the discount. And uh, of course, like and subscribe. But do you have something less to say, Nigel? No, I was going to say, look, I mean, I've given you a code, which is, you know, there's only some very early adopters got a code prior and they've expired. Now you're the only person with a code out there. I want to make one thing clear, though. If you are in uh, an economically disadvantaged uh, part of the world, a regional part of the world, or you're in a personally economically disadvantaged situation because of COVID or other things of that nature, um, we do and will offer regional pricing and we will offer help to those individuals that are finding things a little bit tough. Join the Slack community. You will get that link through James's videos and then reach out to me personally in the Slack community and I will look at your situation, look at the region of the world. We already have people from India and people from Latin America and people from other parts of the world who are taking the training both to become a trainer 
and a consultant in this, but also as just deep learners. And they've all benefited from regional pricing and economic support that we provided. So we're not differentiating. We want this to be education for all. This is education. This is not certification. We'll give you the piece of paper when you've proven yourself. But we are doing this to help people become more holistic, capable people to help the future of organizations. There is genuinely a deep belief in the educational value and benefit of this. And I want to help those that can't afford to pay U.S. rates for training. So if you're not in Western Europe or USA and you can't afford or North America and you're struggling with these things, join the Slack community, reach out to us. We have uh, regional pricing and some support in place for those who are struggling economically or want to have a sea change in their career and they've been affected by the current crises so we will help and support those so i wanted to make that visible to the people who are watching this yes and i'll make sure to try to add that on the end of my other videos as well so that gets on uh as well but uh, just make sure that you can remember to use my links to do it, maybe. But <laughs> awesome. You won't um, get the 10% discount code or coupon or benefit if you don't use James's links. I mean, the links are coded to give you the discount. So unless you use that oh, link, the code know. won't work. So, I mean, that's the key thing. Gotcha. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you, Nigel, for joining us. And of course, if you're a business or a decision maker, I hope that you got a lot out of this. It's probably a little bit longer. Hopefully you were listening to it on times two uh, speed. And I wonder what Nigel sounds like on that. So I have to go look that up and uh, listen to it myself. But uh, without further ado, thank you guys so much. Keep on learning and we'll see you next time.